I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back along to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football family. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiu, and we're bringing you a bit of tactical analysis. How did Arsenal get the better of Newcastle United up at St. James's Park? A game that pretty much everybody expected us to lose, or at least drop points in a game that was supposed to end Arsenal's title hopes, but instead has gone some way to galvanising us Still not in our hands, and obviously it's still going to be incredibly difficult. And we're hoping for a lot of things to go our way, but we're still in it. We're still there. We're still there or thereabouts. And um, and I'm buzzing by the fact that Arsenal went to Newcastle under immense pressure to go and get all three points and that we went there and delivered. And we did it so confidently. I really enjoyed the nature of the performance. And a lot of people will tell you that Arsenal went there and played their game, you know, took the game to Newcastle United, attacked weren't scared of of what they would be leaving behind in terms of committing numbers forward. But having watched the game back again, and a lot of that is true, of course, there were a couple of tweaks that Mikel Arteta made tactically. Perhaps some of them were made by the players themselves, just sort of understanding what's going on around him and uh, around them. And that would be a sign of them improving and developing as well as kind of tacticians and people who understand the game. But there were some slight tweaks. There were some slight differences to what we've normally seen from Arsenal this season. And I wanted to highlight those on this uh, tactical analysis uh, episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Before we dive into it, if I could just ask, leave a like on the video. If you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. If you're brand spanking new as well, that really, really does help. If you're listening on audio, well, please do leave us a review because that helps too um, as we continue to grow the channel and the podcast. And I thank you all uh, for your continued support as always. So we mentioned in the full length episode, um, in the full review episode or the instant reaction. I don't even know what to label these things anymore. Basically, the episode that I recorded about an hour after the full time whistle uh, last night. In that, we talked about the team selection. We talked about Mikel Arteta's decision to stick with Jorginho in midfield um, to to opt for him over Thomas Partey, despite, I think, a lot of us uh, saying and feeling like uh, we'd have been better off with Thomas Partey in the midfield. That's kind of what the general feeling and consensus was in the build-up. That's how I felt anyway. I just worried about Newcastle's midfield of Joe Linton, Bruno Gimaraes and Joe Willock. Knew that they'd be slightly vulnerable defensively, but wondered if we'd have enough of the game to be able to punish them for that, given that we had a midfield that I felt was going to be sort of pulled around quite a bit and may not necessarily have the mobility to deal with the runners coming from the two wide positions and, of course, uh, those runners coming from midfield. And we know that Joe Linton and Joe Willock absolutely love to do that and have done that to great effect um, sort of this season. But Mikel decided otherwise. He decided to go with Jorginho. And he said post-match, didn't he, that he knew that if he went sort of toe-to-toe with Newcastle physically, he would struggle. He knew that that was going to be a big problem. Um, And he knew that even if he went with his most physical lineup, uh, is what I read from what he said kind of between the lines, they still stood a huge chance of being dominated physically. So what needed to happen was Arsenal needed to be really technical really composed on the ball and they needed to be able to play their way through those lines. And it's not to say that Thomas Partey can't do that because he's been doing it all season. He's been phenomenal. But over the last few weeks, he's looked nervous. He's looked shaky um, and and he hasn't been anywhere near his best. And as a result of that, I think Mikel Arteta felt based on what happened against Chelsea the other night as well, where Jorginho came in, was full of confidence, performed impeccably well. The best way to play through this Newcastle side was to do it with Jorginho in the middle of the park. But there was a slight tweak and there was a slight adjustment. So I'm showing you guys on the screen right now, those of you that are watching, uh, the ratings from Sofa Score. I'll share with you their player ratings for each of the Arsenal individuals in a minute. If you want to check out my player ratings post-match, well, you can go over uh, to the Another Slice platform, um, www.anotherslice.com forward slash the Chronicles Uh, or just Chronicles of Aguna. There isn't the the on there, but you'll find it anyway. Just type in another slice Chronicles of Aguna and you can subscribe to our premium uh, premium content for £6 per month. 
a large proportion of that goes to the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. Um, we make that donation from our membership pot as well. Uh, so you wouldn't just be supporting me and the podcast um, and our mission to grow and, and continue doing what we love to do here, which is basically chat about Arsenal all day and every day. Um, you can help us out by doing that. And as I say, you'll get access to post-match player ratings after every single Premier League game. And over the summer, uh, there's going to be lots of uh, transfer related sort of deep dives and uh, analysis pieces coming uh, initially for our members. They'll be released to everybody else a little bit later on. Uh, but if you want content as it comes, uh, then that's the place to be. But just going back to what we saw from um, Arsenal yesterday, it, it wasn't exactly as it looks on the screen. So it wasn't, in my opinion, the 4-3-3 that we've seen with the one man defensive midfield pivot. Now that's what we I say pivot, but the one man defensive midfield, that's what we thought uh, we were going to see because that's what we have seen from Arsenal so often this season. If I just enlarge that uh, for those of you that are, are watching us, you'll be able to see, but Jorginho didn't sit there alone. And I think had Jorginho sat there alone, Arsenal might have had a problem. If you look at the average positions of the two um two sets of players during this game yesterday. Uh, let me um, let me bring that up on my phone. Unfortunately, I can't share this to the screen, but it looked basically like this. So let me just readjust that for you. Uh, so Zinchenko was there. Granit Xhaka was back in here. Jorginho slightly ahead of him. You'll probably be surprised to learn. Martin Odegaard pushed right up into the front line. And that's what Arsenal looked like. Obviously, a little bit deeper generally. So if I drag everyone back just slightly, you'll you'll get an idea. Uh, of what I mean. But you can see that it wasn't quite the formation that we've been used to. It wasn't quite the system that we've been used to. And what Granite Xhaka dropping that little bit deeper did and allowed Arsenal to do was just to offer that little bit of protection to Alexander Zinchenko, who I think we can all agree defensively can be vulnerable at times, particularly in one-on-one -on -one situations. It allowed Gabriel a little bit more cover and a little bit more protection, which I think he's needed in recent weeks because we often talk about Gabriel's duties as a centre-back for Arsenal. A lot of the time he is going out to the left like this and cleaning up for Zinchenko, who does like to drift into midfield. And also he had the concern of Jakob Kivior to his right, who of course um, you know, hasn't played a lot for Arsenal. He's still finding his feet at the club um, and is playing on his wrong side, which I think is something we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But you just look at those average positions and what you can see is that actually Arsenal played with something closer to what resembled a double defensive midfield pivot, which is something that some people suggested we should do earlier on when we were starting to ship goals and when we lost William Saliba and we all felt that we needed that additional bit of protection. Um, you know, it, it has been a problem for us. We haven't been able to find that balance. And I think yesterday we found that. Now, how much of that was down to Mikel Arteta saying, Granit Xhaka, this is what you're going to do alongside Jorginho? And how much of it was down to actually uh, the players just kind of reading the situation and and understanding the areas in which Newcastle were getting joy, how they were getting forward, how they were hurting us and what needed to happen in order to plug those gaps you know, it, it could be a bit of both. And um, and and so it's impossible to put the credit solely on one or the other. But yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting. The other thing you'll notice as well, I know Martinelli likes to play high up the pitch, but he's allowed to stay up the pitch and gives us a bit of an outlet, doesn't he? When we have that extra little bit of protection and those extra bodies on the left-hand side just to maintain that defensive balance. So that was kind of the first thing for me. It was the decision whether made by the players or made by Mikel Arteta, I don't want to attribute the praise to the wrong person. So um, whoever it was that made those decisions, whether it was a collective thing, to just make sure that we plug those gaps, I thought that worked really, really well. It really did. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about Jakub Kivior and his intelligence, because I thought he displayed it in an abundance yesterday. Um, we talked a lot about this thing of, of Jakob Kivior playing on his wrong side. And I put out a tweet last night that went quite big um, by my standards. Um, what is it? I think it's on like 2,600 likes uh, at the moment, which is mad because I tweeted it just before I went to bed and I woke up and it was booming. Um, but the point I made was about Jakob Kivior's uh, intelligence in game and the way he 
didn't allow the circumstance, i.e. the fact that he was playing on his wrong side, to be a problem for him. And what he did was actually embrace it and take decisions and take steps in order uh, to make sure that the impact of that was limited. And what I mean by that is, and we spoke about it a bit yesterday on the, the podcast, but having an opportunity to display this with a tactics board is obviously helpful. But what I'm trying to say is like for a centre-back, right, it's it's important that, you know, you're comfortable running back towards your own goal, especially when you go away to somewhere like Newcastle. And especially when part of your remit and that and it, as it is in this Arsenal team is to squeeze up the pitch and help out. What Jakob Kivior coming into the side has allowed us to do against Chelsea and then Newcastle United is maintain the high line that Arsenal really, really like to play with. That reduces the distances between our back line and our midfield. You can see that based on the average positions. These are the average positions on your screen right now of each of the Arsenal players. And if there's less gap and there's less spaces, there's less room for your opponent to play in between the lines to pull you from pillar to post. And it just makes the whole thing a lot easier. Equally, when you're attacking, if everybody's pushed up the pitch and there are shorter distances between each of the individuals that means that you've got less of a, a space to take care of which means you can press at a much more intense and higher level without running out of gas because you're only patrolling a smaller area so that is really important the fact that he allows us to play with the high line that we want to center backs by nature in the way that they're coached okay will always want to show forwards on the outside and, and what I mean by that is this. If you're Jakob Kivior and someone's coming at you here, you don't want to show them inside. You don't want to show them in towards the centre of the goal. One of the first things you coach as a defender is to send people wide because the more you minimise the angle, uh, the more difficult it is for them to score directly. OK, it can lead to crosses, but that would be on the people in the middle, the people tracking the runs to make sure that they get back and, and make sure that that isn't an issue and that doesn't cause you a problem. But as a centre half, you're taught basically to show them into this space. You want to show them on the outside and then you want to trust your ability to shut that door between them and the goal, whether that be with a block, with a sliding challenge, whether you feel you can get a toe in, that's what you want to do as a centre-back. And that's why when people say, oh, it's not important what foot you play on or what side you play on, it's nonsense. It really, really is important. Because if you're Jakob Kivior here and you're as left-footed as he is, and he's a really left-footed left-footer, if that makes sense, he wants to show people on the outside. But does he have the balance? Does he have the trust? Does he have the confidence in his right side to be able to chase a man down this channel and then step in and make the interception when needed or make that sliding challenge, given that he'd be slightly off balance playing on his weaker side. So this is an issue. Now, Gabriel does this fantastically well. Gabriel will always show people. Um, hold on, let me draw the little box here. He'll always try and show people into this area. And then he trusts in his pace, his athleticism, his ability to time a good challenge to when the moment is right to come in and intervene. That's what centre backs do. They want to show you as wide as possible and then they want to make that intervention when they feel it's the right time. Timing is, of course, key. But if you're Jakob Kivior, what do you do? Because you are on your wrong side and you don't feel 100% comfortable. And what Jakob Kivior did so well was make sure that he wasn't always showing people inside because you don't want to do that. But basically positioning his body in a way whereby he was not allowing people to roast him on the outside. He was making sure that when his position was under scrutiny, i.e. Newcastle were coming forward, that he was showing them into a certain area of the park whereby he could either get help from Ben White, who was much more reserved in his attacking play yesterday to support this. So show them into the area that Ben White can clean them up in. Show them sort of deeper uh, sorry, push them back so that the midfield can get involved and help out by maintaining a high position. And when they did come inside, he would make sure that he shut the door nice and early. Now, Jakob Kivior, by nature, if you've seen him play prior to his arrival at Arsenal, is a very front-footed defender. He wants to squeeze people up. He wants to snap away at your heels, a bit like Gabriel does, a bit like William Saliba does. But what he did yesterday was recognise that he's on his wrong side and recognise that if he got too tight, it would be very easy for somebody like Callum Wilson, who has bags of pace, Alexander Isak, who's deceivingly quick as well, it would be too easy for them to spin him 
and take him on on the outside, which would make him incredibly uncomfortable. So he just dropped off a little bit off of those individuals when he needed to and made sure that the game was being played in front of him so that he could position himself right, position his body right, and uh, and make sure that he could use the help of Ben White, of Jorginho, of Granit Xhaka on occasions, of Gabriel if needs be, that he could usher the ball back to Aaron Ramsdale, that he was presenting in an option at all times. So Jakob Kivior, the way he played the game yesterday was, uh, was I thought, incredibly intelligent. Now, is that because Jakob Kivior himself figured out what needed to happen and what needed to be different? Or is that coaching? We don't really know again, but it's it's brilliance. And it, it really, really impressed me, I have to say. And um, I want to give full credit to Jakob Kivio because it don't matter how well you're coached and how many times you're shown things, you have to go out there and execute it. And to do it under those circumstances in that environment, I thought was really, really impressive. So kudos to uh, Jakob Kivio, who I thought had a, a fantastic game uh, for Arsenal yesterday. Look, going to take a very, very short pause. Uh, going to bring you a quick message from our sponsors and we'll be back. The Chronicles of a Guna podcast is currently sponsored by the good people over at NordVPN and we thank them uh, for their support of the show. It really does mean the world to me. But this is a service that I promise you, if you sign up to, you will enjoy. You can reap the rewards for this and it's the price of a cup of coffee per month which is nothing really when you think about what you get. So what is NordVPN? It's a virtual private network service which allows you to surf the internet via this virtual private network, which adds an additional layer of security. If you're somebody that travels a lot and you use public Wi-Fi a lot, this is really, really important in terms of protecting your data. It adds that extra layer, as I say, and makes it very, very difficult for people to access your devices or to get hold of your details. On top of that, Using the virtual private network feature, you can change your location, which is incredible. You can make your internet browser think that you are anywhere pretty much in the world, which has its benefits. For example, log into Netflix from a US location and you'll be able to access a totally different inventory of stuff, which is amazing. It's the dream. How many times have we said that we're bored of what's on Netflix? There you go. That opens up so many doors. For me, I like to watch Greek football, Greek television from time to time, but I can't access any of the iPlayers here in the UK because they're geo-blocked. So what do I do? I log into NordVPN. I change my location to Greece or to Cyprus, depending on what I want to watch, and I'm able to access that content. When I scroll through Twitter, I don't have any of that nonsense. This content is not available in your, in your region because I set it to where I want to be, and I can access pretty much anything. I can access streams, content and subscriptions that aren't normally available in my region. It's amazing. The possibilities are incredible. Uh, you will see the internet in a completely different light. And when I'm looking for flights to travel abroad, for example, I am able to search from the place I'm going. And often you'll find that they come up quite a bit cheaper. So there's a lot of benefits to be gained as well as the added layer of protection that you get. NordVPN.com forward slash chronicles afc sign up the link is in the description below and if you do it now you'll not only get a huge discount on your plan you'll also get four additional months for free well worth it i promise you if you don't like it if you're not happy with it if it's not giving you what you want out of it you can get your money back as well within 30 days so there is no risk really nordvpn.com forward slash chronicles afc we thank them for their support of the podcast <laughs> OK, so we've talked about the midfield shape. We've talked about Jakob Kivior and the intelligence with which he played the game yesterday up at St. James's Park. Let's talk a little bit about Ben White, because I think this one has actually gone under the radar. I don't think Ben White has got enough credit. And I think this is a, 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 the right one to follow on from the Kivior chat, because I think these two um, are, are related in that. Jakob Kivior, as I said, at times was having to usher people into areas of the park where he felt more comfortable dealing with them. And a lot of that was down to Ben White sticking um, close to him wherever possible and not being as forward thinking as he has been at times this season. Often we've seen him bomb on the outside of Saka, get forward much more frequently, cross the halfway line at every opportunity outside of just the natural team shape in terms of squeezing up. He's normally been that little bit more aggressive in the way that he attacks. He was well aware of maybe what Jakob Kivior was having to cope with, having to deal with. And he was well aware of the fact that Newcastle had played with Isak and Callum Wilson. Now, Isak 
who has the ability to be a game changer, somebody that we were heavily linked with as well prior to his move to Newcastle, was operating mainly from that left-hand side. Did that have an impact on Ben White being that little bit more reserved? Probably, but I think you still have to give Ben White immense credit for understanding the game that he was in, the game that he was playing, and modifying what he was doing to a point where he could support Kivy or also tuck slightly infield and help protect in the middle of the park, but also keeping tabs on an incredibly talent, uh, talented attacker in Alexander Isak. Probably not at his best Isak from the left-hand side, but you did see at times as well um, Callum Wilson drifting out there and those two swapping. So, yeah, I want to give uh, Ben White uh, a shout out as well. The final thing I want to touch on um, when we're talking about the sort of tweaks that Arsenal made um, in the game yesterday against Newcastle United is Mikel Arteta's pre-game decision. Now, this could have gone horribly wrong. This could have backfired. There's no doubt about that. But he took the decision, Mikel Arteta, not to be obsessed by the physical battle, not to be obsessed by, by this idea of having to compete physically at all times. And we touched on it a little bit at the start of the podcast, but it was this acceptance of where his team are at for me that showed maturity and showed that he's improved and showed that he's developed. And, and we saw that, I think, when he decided to take off Zinchenko when he did and replace him with Kieran Tierney. That was a change that should have been made at Anfield and wasn't made early enough, in my opinion. This time, though, Mikel recognised it and he was proactive rather than reactive. And that's what you want your coach and manager to be. We talked a lot about the game management of our players going down, staying down, doing all the dark arts, doing all those things that Newcastle were doing when they played us back in January at Emirates Stadium. And that left us feeling incredibly frustrated. We have at times been a little bit naive. And so to see the players learning, but also the coach learning, I think for me, is important. But the overriding point around how he approached this game, the decision not to be obsessed by the physical contest and actually to focus on, right, we know that they're going to come on to us strong. We know that they're going to be aggressive in the way they press us. Let's work out how best to set up in order to be able to play around that. I thought was bold, but proved to be genius from Mikel Arteta because I wouldn't have gone that way. And I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't have gone that way, which is a test, which, which highlights what a bold decision that actually was. Now, when you get these things wrong, everybody's on your case and everybody hammers you. But when you get these things right, you deserve praise and you deserve credit. And I certainly think um, the Arsenal deserve credit um, for, for sort of approaching the, the game in the way that they did. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted by how it went. Were there moments where it was just a little bit stressful? Yeah, of course there were. Um, were there moments where you worried about how it was going to end up? Of course there were. Um, did we ride our luck at times when Newcastle hit the woodwork on a couple of occasions? I know we hit it once as well. Yeah, we did. But I think overall, the manager got it right. The players got it right. Um, you know, it was it was just a great afternoon all round um, from Mikel Arteta's side. And um, and I was really, really uh, impressed by it. I'm just taking a picture of a, a baby fox in my garden. Um, they've been coming in and out the last few days. Crazy. Sorry to get distracted mid-recording, uh, but you'll forgive me. This little, tiny little fox. It's, uh, look at him. Look at him. Oh. I had one in the garden the other day as well. Um, it didn't look too well, and his mum came and got him, picked him up in her mouth and took him away. Hope he's all right. Why am I talking about foxes? Anyway, let's <laughs> let's get back to it. But yeah, look, tactically, I thought Arsenal got it right. I thought Mikel Arteta got it right. I thought the players executed it to a T. Did we have difficult moments? Yes. And you're going to experience those at St. James's Park, as I keep saying. But Jorginho's inclusion was genius. Um, some people will say it was obvious because of how he played against Chelsea and how bad Thomas Partey has been of late. But I don't think it was the obvious thing. So I want to give the manager his dues, his praise and his credit. and. Um, and uh, now we've got three games remaining. Let's go and win them. You know, it won't be easy. Nothing is in the Premier League. Brighton at home next. Difficult opponent. But if if Manchester City could drop points at Everton and they play that game just before we play Brighton, it, 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 I don't even want to say it, but it could be on. It could be on. Got to keep believing. Got to keep pushing. Got to keep trying. Got to do our job between now and the end of the season. And if we fall short, We'll say valiant effort, fair play. I'll be pleased that we at least gave it a good go and a good fight after the setbacks of 
the last month or so. If we if we do win it, oh my word, I can't even put into words how I'll feel and, and the celebrations that you'll see come out of me. I'll probably go on a five-day bender. I'm not even going to lie. Uh, but there we go. Anyway, guys, thank you all so, so much uh, for joining me um, on this tactical analysis show. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we used to do a lot more of these. We haven't done so many recently because our system's been really clear and and I haven't really come away from many games thinking, oh, that was really good and, and really interesting tactically. And this is something we should speak about. We talked a lot at the start of the season about the inverted fullbacks, what that gives us, how we like to press the, the high line, all of those things. And I didn't want to just keep repeating those same conversations. Um, but yeah, um, we won at Newcastle by two goals to nil. Uh, we were winning one nil at half time, thanks to Martin Odegaard. And then Gabriel Martinelli's brilliant play led to a Fabian Scher own goal that won it for the Gunners. Let me know your thoughts on the comments below. How impressed were you with Jakub Kivi or how impressed were you by Jorginho? Aaron Ramsdale made a couple of really big saves as well. Is he getting the praise he deserves? I know he made a mistake at Southampton, but he is absolutely flying at the moment for Arsenal. I think was voted on Arsenal.com as Arsenal's player of the match yesterday. Thank you as always for tuning in. I'll catch you all soon with more Arsenal-related content. Until next time, goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.